Hey everybody, I'm Rick Beato. Today's episode is called Modern Masters of Amp Design. When I was out in LA for the NAMM show, I got a chance to sit down with four different amp builders. One of them is the legendary Michael Saldano of Saldano Amps. Also, Dave Friedman, you all know Friedman Amps. Uh, Joe Morgan from Morgan Amps and Peter Ahrens. Peter is of Tone King Amplifiers and also Synergy, who makes the new Steve Vai modules. Now, this is more like a podcast. It's an hour long, and I have four segments in there. So this is something that you're going to want to probably watch, maybe uh, in sections. But I encourage you to watch the whole thing. It's really interesting. It's different than some of my interviews because I actually talk more than I normally do in it because it's more conversational. So I hope you enjoy it. Check it out. Here it is. Hey, everybody. I'm here with Michael Saldano, who is one of the most famous and the original boutique amp builders. Right behind us is the SLO or his flagship amp that has been around for 33 years yeah, or so? Yeah, 33 plus years, yeah. I've heard about you for forever. Well, and yeah, I have been around forever, I, uh, as the gray hair shows. <laughs> I want to ask you some things that we haven't talked about okay. today. So, did you work for Yamaha at one point? I did, as a matter of fact. So, when I first got established in Hollywood when I moved down from Seattle, got started my little shop in Melrose, 700 square feet on Melrose Ave. I was, re well, I was completely unknown then, but I was slowly starting to get known around just the greater LA area. You know, Luca Third got an amp from me and, you know, and, and that little grapevine spread the word really quickly. And so after I'd been in LA about a year, um, I was I was doing some work. Well, I'd, I'd done some work for Charlie Sexton earlier, mm -hmm. and then later, um, Charlie's guitar tech, who was a guy named Mark Youngersmith, got the gig playing guitar in Billy Idol's band after Steve Stevens split. And so I I got a call from Mark, and he was like, "Hey, I want to try out some. I want to try out some Soldano stuff because I might want to use this for my upcoming gig with with Billy, you know." And and so I had gone up to a rehearsal place up in North Hollywood that was right next door to Andy Brower's Studio Reynolds. I think it was, I can't remember the name of the place. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Anyway, and Mark had a room there and he, what he was basically doing was just kind of trying different stuff out, different amps out for his setup. And so I had an appointment one afternoon to show up with, with an SLO because he wanted to check out an SLO 100. And as I, I got there a little early, as I walked in, I heard him playing another amp, and and I kind of just peeked in the room, and and he had some amp up on stage with him that looked to me like some kind of a weird prototype, and there were all these guys in business suits and stuff sitting out, kind of like observing, and I I didn't give it any extra thought. I thought they were his management or something else, and so. They talked a little bit. The amp got packed up, got taken away. Those guys kind of walked out and so I got Mark's I got my amp up there set up plugged Mark in and Mark started cranking on this thing well what I didn't know during this time by the way Mark decided he just had to have the SLO and so that deal was signed and sealed right then and there right and I was really excited and happy well what I didn't know is one the guys that were there were, were the guys from Yamaha of America okay and was one of them was kind of the head project manager guy named Paul Meisenthal. Well, they heard that amp when they were leaving, and I guess Paul got a hold of a friend of mine, Ed Simeon, uh -huh. uh, because they were, you know, they knew each other from the business, and Ed was an associate of mine as well. He had, he was the guy who imported, at the time, he was the one that brought TC Electronics into the United States from, from Denmark. So he was tied in, and so Paul didn't know, I guess didn't know how to get a hold of me, so he had asked Ed who this guy was with this amp that, you know, he was showing to... Paul, well, and I, so they scheduled a meeting, you know, my friend Ed called me up, he said, hey, we got a meeting with Yamaha, they, they heard, you know, that amp that, you, you know, that Mark was trying out, and they want to talk to you, and so, um, so he kind of put the deal together, and I ended up getting hired by Yamaha to build, to design them, I didn't have to build them, I just had to design them an amp 
because they they were trying to really work their way back into the guitar thing. You know, they, they built wonderful guitars and instruments, but they always seemed to fall a little short on the amps. They were doing a lot of solid state yeah, stuff. Yeah, 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 I remember. Yeah, nobody yeah. was really digging the amps. But no. the guitars were pretty cool. Like, you know, Santana played those SG 2000s That's right. and stuff. And so they got a hold of, so through Ed, I, I got involved with them, and we ended up designing a really nice little, uh, well, two amps, actually, well, four is it? Two two wattages, about fifty watt and hundred watt. Either as a rack mountable head that came in a head shell, but you could pull it out and put it in a rack if you wanted to. Okay. And a really nice little single twelve combo. So the hundred watt combo, fifty watt combo, hundred watt head, and fifty watt head. And what was the, what was the model number? So the, the models were the T fifty one. Uh, excuse me, the T. The T50 and T100, right? The T50 and T100, and then the combos were T50C and T100C. Okay. So those were the models. Okay, and what year would this have been? So this would have been like, like, if, I were to, if I wanted to go buy one of those right now, what year would I... You'd probably be looking for 89 or 90. Okay. But we started on the project, I believe, in late 88. Okay. I think it was in production by 1990. And the production was actually initially handled by um, Dennis Kager, who was famous for being involved in the APEG SVT. And he had a manufacturing facility on the East Coast that used to build sundown amps, which were a little amp that was kind of popular at the time. And so the original Yamahas were built in the sundown shop. And then later they moved to uh, one of Yamaha's facilities down in Georgia, and that was the Yamaha plant in Georgia where they made, it was mainly the piano plant, but they also had space there and they were doing the amps. So that was the, that was the T-series Yamahas. And so quite honestly, the advertising they did for those products really helped boost my reputation and my products as well, because they did these really wonderful magazine shoots where, you know, I'm sitting there on top of an amp and I'm, <laughs> you know, there's, oh, it was really silly, but you know, it was, it was uh, it was totally the '80s. I mean, you look at it; it's a totally '80s kind of deal. But they really helped put me on the map, and it was through doing that particular little uh, design project with them that it happened. And those amps are, st- are an amazing bargain these days because they don't. Well, suffer. I'm going to go buy one before I put this video out. Oh, awesome! So that because uh, <laughs> everyone's going to go look. Well, and they're not expensive. I mean, they, they're a, they're they're one of the best bang for the buck used amp purchases you can find because for some reason they never really gained any kind of big resale value but they sound really well they're built really well and you know it's like good good bang for the buck for sure so yeah you should be able to find them they built quite a few of them um they morphed a little bit over the years which i was not happy about that's kind of part of why we stopped doing it was because contractually they weren't supposed to modify anything without my permission yeah but they got in there and started for whatever reason i still don't to this day know why but they kind of messed up the reverb circuit in the thing and that kind of put me off a bit and we just kind of pulled the plug on the whole deal it, it's some i think about two years into it okay so the slo yes when you uh, i mean when i was starting to play in bands in the late 80s early 90s mm-hmm. this was like the you know this was the, that's when this amp was out yeah, yeah this was the you know this was the amp to have i never could afford one i told michael this before <laughs> um they were expensive they were expensive. everything out yeah buried everything else it was all it was all handmade now. yeah all hand built all hand built. quality parts yeah. yeah and you were really the first boutique amp builder yeah you know i i i never really fully believed that early on because you know i was like oh come on people no, but, but that as, was it. as time as history has proven i kind of I think I can say nowadays without absolutely without you know sounding like you know a brag or anything that yeah I think I was I think I was the original boutique guy I think I was the one that sort of paved the way to where guys would be like hey I can do this too you know you know you don't have to build ten thousand amps a year you can build a handful of really high quality amps and there's a there's a market out there that'll buy them so yeah I think I I think I am maybe the the granddaddy of the boutique amp. Okay, so the, the so the SLO is a paint peeler. Right? Yeah, it's a powerful it's lamp. A very powerful. Well, lamp. you have a thirty watt version now. That is, yes. is it out already? 
I believe it's going to be. I think it's going to be available after now. Right think, after now, I, I think. I think they're up to production speed on it right now. And so yes, it's a. It's a true 30 watt SLO. It's like the entire feature set, the same preamp circuitry, everything's the same except it's got a nice little 30 watt power section. It's a little bit smaller physically. And what tube, what power tubes would be in it? We'll be using 5881s. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's always been kind of my go to tubes, mm -hmm. 6L6 slash 5881. And so it'll be running 5881s with a lower plate voltage, which is what brings it down Got it. to that magic little. Well, it's actually 33 watts because it's our 33rd anniversary. <laughs> so it's kind did of. Did you do that on purpose or not? Well, I, I personally didn't do that on purpose, but I think Peter did. So I think he kind of tweaked the voltage until we got just to that right that spot just because he thought cool. it'd be pretty fun. And, no, that's cool. And I love it. I mean, I, I'm so happy he did. So yeah. Well, that's uh, 30 watts is a perfect. It's a good. It's a good compromise. It's a there. good power. You know, it's it's something where you can certainly use it in a studio to do anything you need to do. Yep. You can turn it down and still play it at home, even if you've got neighbors. And yet, it's big enough that you can go out and play in a club. You can yeah. even play in a small, you know, concert setting because you know nowadays everybody uses the PA anyway. So it's a real nice power size. It's it, and it's easy on the ears because you can crank it up without peeling the paint off the walls or the ears off the side of your head. Okay, so <laughs> I asked Michael earlier about the clean channel mm -hmm. on the original SLOs. Mm -hmm. And I asked him if the clean channel was actually out of phase. Out of phase. And it is. Yes. And I noticed, on the record. <laughs> I noticed this when I had played them years ago that if I turn the overdrive channel down very, very low. That's right. You just hear a hint a hint of the clean channel. Yeah. And I thought I was imagining that. No, no thought, you were not imagining And I thought, I wonder if that's out of phase. And it is. And and it was one of those deals, as I told you earlier, Dave, but we'll do it for, for the viewers out there. When I originally designed the SLO, this, the devices I was using for the channel switch and everything were these things called... Um, uh, LDRs, they're basically like a little photo cell and there's a little LED in there and so it's an optical switch so rather than a mechanical switch where contacts are coming together you're just running the signal through a resistor that's, that's light sensitive and then the LED turns on, the resistance drops, the current flows through, blah blah blah, not to get technical. But anyway, they were, they were a nice way to do silent switching because the biggest challenge back in the day Building right. channel switching amp is making it not pop when That's it's right. switched. Yeah, yeah. And so the LDR solved all that problem. The problem is though they were very expensive components and the circuitry to make them all work got somewhat complex when you had to do multifunctions. So what I decided was, well, you know, nobody's really gonna ever play the thing with the gain turned down that low and they're no. not and the signal coming out of the overdrive channel is so much hotter that I'll just bury that clean channel when I when it goes to the overdrive, so there's no need to turn it off. I'll just have it it'll just kind of be there in the background, it'll get buried under the overdrive. It's non problem. Right. No one I've I never no and never <laughs> heard anyone mention it ever before. I, and I've only had, like I was telling you earlier, less than a dozen guys that ever noticed it you're when you're one of those and like, just because i was just having me you know playing around yeah. with that and turning it down down, yeah. down 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 and then i just heard just faintly it, and it's it is true and and like i say most people never ever heard it and that's why i figured i could get away with it because i knew it just wasn't that noticeable and so but the new version does but, not yeah so that. the new version and which i've so since about the Oh, early 2000s, I started working with relays to do all my channel switching. I kind of figured out how you can make that happen without making noise and all that. And relays actually are better. They're more reliable. They're a true con switch contact, so they're the most they're the most pure kind of hard back bypass and everything. And the beauty of the relay is you can turn off the one channel, turn on the other one completely, and have them completely be separate. So the new SLO 100, as well as the new SLO 30, all use relays for switching. And now, when you go on the overdrive channel, that clean channel is gone. It's not there at all. And uh, but you would never have ever noticed it <coughs> ever until we years. Not until we brought it up today. No, that's right. Yeah, but it's true. It's it's there. And and the only other time that it would ever show up would be when Pro Tools became. When all of a sudden recording went to Pro Tools, 
I would not that they noticed that they were that both channels were on at the same time, but I'd get recording engineers that would call me up and be like, you know, I'm looking at these two tracks that we track simultaneously, and we had two amps, and we had one in the clean channel, one in the overdrive channel. And, and they're I've on noticed, the face. yeah, that's what because on Pro Tools you can see that visually yeah. when you look at you know all yeah. the little waveforms. Up to that point, nobody ever know, noticed or cared. Yeah. But once they could visually see it, all of a sudden it became like, it's out of phase. Oh, my God. The well, sky's falling. Did you hear anything weird? No. Well, then don't worry about it. You know? Exactly. <laughs> so it's funny how as technology advanced, things had to evolve to accommodate the technology. And yeah. that's one thing that this amp is. This is an evolution of what in 1987 was a super far ahead of its curved design by now there were some things that started showing up that today's standards like for one thing noise like in the old days if an amp had a little bit of hiss or not care. nobody cared nobody all cared. amps made noise even if that's right hiss, you know they sounded weird if they didn't make noise exactly yeah. I mean, you thought it was dead it wasn't right. working <laughs> but now the, the bar has been risen so high for recording standards you know it's like yeah. nowadays when a guitar player stops playing, the engineer expects the room to be silent as a pin dropping. Yeah. And so one of the things we did in the new, the, both the new SLOs is we now DC heaters in here. So the preamp tubes no longer are running on AC for the filaments because what the problem has always been, but it was easier to manage in the older day, old days because the tubes were better, but there's always the potential for the noise from the AC on the heater filament, the little part that glows inside yep. the tube, to actually broadcast onto the cathode of the tube, which is what it's heating up, and getting into the audio chain. And tubes that were made back in the olden days, you know, like 50s on up to the very, very late 70s or even early 80s, most of those tubes were made, well, most of them were made in America for starters. So. Right. Um, but they were also made on machinery that was still in very good condition because, you know, they maintained it because tubes were still... Yes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now, I'm just glad we still even have vacuum tubes. But the sad part is a lot of that machinery is now sitting in factories in Eastern Europe, which is fine, except the maintenance isn't being done like it was back when the U.S. military was buying tubes and saying to the sure, tube the, manufacturer, it better be this quiet because yeah. we're using it in our radar systems. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the, so the manufacturing has become a little bit less precise or maybe a little more lax than it used to be. So all of a sudden, I started noticing towards the end of the 90s that tubes were getting noisier. And me being me, I'm kind of stubborn about changing anything. So I was like, ah, you know, the AC heaters are fine. I'll just hand pick those preamp tubes and make it quiet which I was successful right up to the last SLO I ever built. I was able to sit there in my test room with a big box of 12 ax 7s and spend about anywhere from a half hour to an hour on each amp, hand-picking those first two position 12 ax 7s to get the amp to be quiet. Well, A, that was a big pain in the butt, and B, it really puts a burden on the end user because when they go to replace those tubes, that's right. they need to do the same thing. Yeah. So when we did these amps, I was like, okay, Job one is we're putting DC heaters in this baby since we're redesigning it anyway. Let's get those heaters quiet so now you can put any tube in it and it'll be quiet and it'll it'll be quiet enough to re to meet the standards that modern recording engineers have come to re, to to demand because in the old days I mean I even remember going into studios the big studios like Oceanway or something and you know I'd hear the you know, they'd be getting ready to track somebody. They'd be using one of my amps, and the you know the amp would the amp would be in the control room, but the speaker cap would be out in the room. And they'd have it cranked to the moon, you know, because nobody's in there to get their ears destroyed. And there'd be you know, the, you know, the guy be sitting there with the guitar, the volume rolled off, but there'd be this, mm, shh, you know, noise in the background. Engineers didn't even care. They're That's like, right. ah, it's gonna be when he starts playing, you're not even gonna hear that. And That's right. And, and That's of course, true. which is true. Which is true. Yeah. But nowadays, with all the with all the technology we have behind recording, these engineers aren't so tolerant. They're like, I'm hearing something, what is that? You know? <laughs> and so, the, so they really put the pressure on us amp makers to build quieter products. And so I, I'm so glad that we were able to finally address that. I should have done it about five years ago, to be all honesty, but the new amps have it and I'm really glad about that. Excellent. So yeah, so it's kind of like we've evolved to match the evolving 
technology and the same thing with the you know the the channel switching thing it's just like nobody cared back then but yeah they're, they're they see it and they're more aware of it now hey everybody I have the distinct honor of having Dave Friedman here you all know his amplifiers and this is at absolutely beautiful red Tolex here. I don't have any red amplifiers in my studio and that is beautiful. Is this a new amplifier, Dave? Uh, yeah, it's a, a new limited edition amplifier that I did with Jakey Lee. Mm -hmm. A little blast from the past here. And, Love Jakey um, Lee. Uh, actually, you know, I'm going to go on record here and people are going to get angry. Okay. He was my favorite Aussie guitar player. Okay. Uh, you heard it from Dave right here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I know. People say Randy, but I'm sorry, I like Jake. If you took a brand new Plexi from the 60s, right? Okay. And, and then took a brand new amp today. I mean, people, the, the tolerances back then were so all over the place, right? Once you start adding these different components together, is that why amps from then sound so different from one another versus today you can make things that are far more no. similar? No, not really. Okay, explain what, this what, to me. What, what it was is they didn't really give a rat's ass and mm -hmm. the circuits were different. Okay. So if they ran out of a 100K resistor, they'll swap in an 82K resistor. I've seen Marshalls where plate resistors are normally 100K in the, in the amp. And mm -hmm. wow, that's original from the factory, they're 82K. They must have run out that day. Right. Also, the, the specs have changed a little bit over the years. So, so like early 50 watts were a certain spec, and then it later changed to super lead specs. So some might be brighter, some might be more basement-like. So you're going, well, this one sounds great, but this one I don't like. It's farty and loose and stuff. Well, that's, it's not the same circuit. So generally speaking, no, I don't think, I don't think the tolerances really are any different, to be honest. Um, and can you make a new amp sound like an old amp? Yes, you can. Okay. You have to know how to do it. You have, and you might choose slightly different parts, but you you can do it. Okay, so the amplifier and the speaker cabinet. So I did a video probably about a month ago or so where I took a 1971 JMP mm -hmm. and a 1980 Park, and I put them with the same miking. I used a 57 and a 121 mm -hmm. or 122 V yeah. Royer, but I had my one mic clip, so it was easy to place them in the same spot on every amp. Right. And I wanted to show people how much of a difference the speaker cabinet makes as well. Oh God, yeah. Massively big difference. Massive. And the people couldn't tell. I had a high watt with 75 watt phase. I had a cabinet with 65 watt selections, original ones. Mm -hmm. I had one with, with V uh, vintage mm -hmm. 30s and one with a 25 watt. I think I Remax. watched some of that. Yeah. yeah. And they, People don't realize that you can take the same head and put it through four different cabinets and it sounds radically different. It's like four different heads. Yes. Radically different. Radically different. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I generally when I'm developing amps, I listen through vintage 30s and, and greenbacks, generally speaking. That was my Those are the question. two common. Most common. Speaker for me. Yep. Um, which is why in my cabs, I generally blend the two. Mm -hmm. So the standard cab is a blend of two. I like... There's a certain thing about a Vintage 30 I like yep. because it has a certain punch and wallop to it. It has some really uh, muscular push, mm -hmm. but it can be a little bright. It can be a little on the high mid thing, yeah. a little pokey, which works for some things. Um, but then the greenbacks also have this great woody, papery sort of great tone also. I, I think most people don't realize how big of a difference that the, the speaker kept. The construction, the speakers... So so much the grill oh. cloth, everything. Oh yeah, the, the construction. Um, um, I remember years ago with playing with cabinets and how they're constructed and what wood they're made out of. Pretty much, there's you have to use Baltic birch. Period. I mean, it, there's not. It's not going to sound. If you want it to sound like the classic Marshall cab that yeah. you know you had, or it has to be Baltic birch. All those great cabinets were made with Baltic birch. But then there's thicknesses and overall construction of the cabinet. It all affects how that speaker sounds. Even close mic, it affects how that Absolutely. speaker sounds. Absolutely, it, it's how it reacts and how the cone moves and different things. It's totally different. So, I mean, I, I'm a fan of the old English Marshall yeah. style cabinets. So, uh, you know, ours are kind of modeled after that mm -hmm. vibe. So, there is some other good cabinets. So, there's some Sound City cabinets were made really cool that you know sound great. Some Hiwa cabinets were made great. 
Some old orange cabinets were cool. Yeah. Also, but they're a little... It can be stiffer or harder or softer or, you know, that's, that's yeah. all the cabinet. Van Halen was recording uh, uh, the for uh, the Fuck album, right? So yeah. When they were recording that record, he was using a Soldano for it. And he had rented a cabinet from Andy Brower's studio rentals at the time. Yeah. And it was a 800 cabinet slant that I do believe had 70 watt Celestians in it. Yeah. Or whatever the standard is at the time. Maybe it was 65. I'm not exactly sure about that. But, and that with the Soldano sounded really good because those speakers sound a little cleaner. And they're not hairy sounding, and the Soldano has a little more hair to it. It does. So it balances it out a little bit, and that's what was used on that record. And then later he bought the cabinet from them because he wanted it. Yeah. It's just interesting. It's like, you know, what works with some things won't work with others. I, I meet kids nowadays that have never played through real amps. I know, and that's it's very weird. And to that's me. weird. And you know what? You want to know the fun part about that? What's that? Is if you plug them into a real amp. And turn it up. Oh, they'll freak out. They they, they love it. They, they they love it, but they also can't control it and have no That's idea right. what to do with it. Yeah, that came up. Uh, we were, I was talking. Uh, Jake was in town just a couple days ago, and we were talking about that. And he said he had some guy that was opening up for him on this last tour, and he was using a modeler or something to play through. And, and Jake's like, "Hey, you want to try my rig?" He's <laughs> like, "Yeah, yeah, I want to try your rig." That's on 10. <laughs> like squeals and things. And it's like, how do you do that? How do you... Well, it's easy. He'll pick up the guitar and stand right there and be like, yeah, that's all fine. Not squealing, nothing. Phil X plays Friedman Amps, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Phil's a, a very dear friend of mine. And um, he... Uh, I love the way that he articulates and he can really control his sound and he's just such a great player and he has a really great idea for sound Mm -hmm. as a player and um it's interesting that he he told me to say hello too by the way (laughs) so um i'll see him at the nam so if i took so this amp right here compared to this so what is tell me about this so this is the steve stevens uh the, the, a new version of it. It's the uh, SS100 V2. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we took the original Steve Stevens and kind of added some features that it didn't have before. It mm-hmm. has three channels, but now it has, for the third channel, it has a separate gain and master, so you have control over it. We added like a, a thump control, a system volume, some of the stuff we did on our B100 Deluxe amp. And then we revoiced the circuit a little bit because he had changed his what he wanted a little bit out of it and it's a little more percussive now than before and it's just a little little different in tone than before um it's fun working with really great guitar players absolutely so you work with you know a guy like this or a guy like this or or phil or or jerry cantrell or this or that and it's especially like the guys that were really know how to articulate what they want yes steve is very much that Jake is very much that. Phil knew what he wanted when he heard it, mm-hmm. you know. So we were sitting there changing parts, and he'll tell that story. We're sitting there, and like, do you like this? No, no. Well, no, a little bit. Okay, hold on. <laughs> okay, bit. Oh yeah, there we go. I like that, you know. And the funny thing about Phil, when I first met Phil, I was doing an LA Amp show with Friedman, and he came in the room, and we had a you know whole wall of like stacks that just looked impressive, you know. He came in and played through a B100 for the first time. And the very first thing he did is reach to the gain and turned it down. Yeah. And I'm like going, thank you. Yes. You're the first guy that did that. And it just sounded, you know, all of a sudden it's... It has articulation, open. open, Yeah, I always used to tell bands, okay, they come in when I was producing, they come in, these heavy bands. I was Mm -hmm. like, no, we got to turn the gain back. What? I can't play. No, you have to learn how to play. You got to get the sound. I, I'm telling you, this is going to sound way better when it's recorded. Mm-hmm. You can't just. Oh yeah. Yeah, they don't get that. And that, but when they hear it back, Dave, they're they. they oh yeah. Oh it's my awesome. god. Yeah, it's great. I said you have to just have enough to do what you need to do. If you're going to do pick squeals and things like that, you know, yeah. pinch harmonics. Yeah, you have to have enough gain to do those. But but 
if that's what you're doing. But you can't, you don't want to oversaturate because you, you can't, there's nothing you can do with that. It starts getting flat, no dynamics. Mm -hmm. The, it sags too much, um, or just layer it even with a cleaner. Oh you know, yeah, like a, you know. So if you want a little more saturated, okay, play this and do your thing with this, but then do it with this one too. Okay, let me ask you the the greatest amp ever made, vintage amp. What what was it? What do you think? What's your favorite vintage amp? Oh well, it, it would have to be um, a, a Plexi. 100 or 50. What year? Super lead spec, probably around 68. Hey everybody, I'm here with Peter. Peter, we're, we're talking about, we were just talking one second ago about your Synergy amplifier and this platform. And I just said, a second ago, I said, oh, I have the Randall three channel um, M MDS, MDS yeah, uh, module head that I don't think I've used it in any of my videos, and one of the reasons is that the fan is noisy on the head. Oh, all right. I have to have it replaced. And it's unbelievably heavy. I mean, it's almost impossible. The, the three-channel ones were almost impossible to lift up, but the, four, but the concept is great. Yeah. Can we talk about that, about the Absolutely. preamps? And, Absolutely. And, and, okay, so this is, for those of you that are familiar with the Randall platform, I think was, it goes back Ignator, to Ignator started it, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, the, the idea initially, and he patented, patented it initially, so he came up with that idea. I mean, Bruce is a great guy and mm -hmm. always creative ideas, so yeah, and he started that all. And I think he later on sold it to, uh, to Randall, yep. and we took over a few years ago. All of the modules are preamp modules that have tubes in them. Right. Um, I want to ask about having to power multiple modules. If you're powering these two modules, is the essentially it's a clean power amp that you have, and these, so to speak, yeah, yeah, so to speak. Do you um, is the tone shaped when you're when you're coming up with these? You you. It's pretty, do it. yeah. You do it through the heads to to see how they sound, how they're going to sound, the way that we they're going to be. We used. do. I mean, we we pick certain scenarios, um, certainly into a power amp, yep. sort of like our SIM fifty fifty. Yeah. We also, for sure, check it with IRs direct into a door or any sort of mixer. Um, we check it with an actual head. We check it with combos with a four cable method. Um, because I mean, we both know there are hundreds of millions of hot rods out there, and yeah. uh, pretty much every guy can grab his SIN one or something, or and put it onto a hot rod, use the four cable method, and it's pretty much done with it. So it's a it's a convenient system for for all all scenarios. You can use it in the studio in the rehearsal, you name it. So. Well, the great thing is that you can have radically different amps. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's essentially, you know, this has two completely separate amplifiers because yeah. the preamp sections can be totally different. So on a gig, mm -hmm. this is really, as opposed to having presets or something or using pedals, these are literally having two separate amplifiers in one box. Kind of, yeah. And the challenge is even more with those preamp modules that we sort of also have to capture the power amp of the respective amp. Mm -hmm. So that means when we design the, those units, um, we hear them actually compared to the actual amp. Right. Um, and, you know, I don't want to claim that it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. That would just not be true. Um, but it's pretty damn close with yeah. many of those. So, um, and it, it's not supposed to be a replacement for an actual amp if you want to get your I don't know your plexi marshal and yeah. then just grab it I mean that's not it's not supposed to be that but it gives you that thing pretty convenient and well um, in a afford more affordable version and stuff like that so that and the modules are very easy to swap out they just have the thumb screws right absolutely yeah you can see here I mean, no, no, no. Already. Yeah. So we take it out and wow. we're done with it. Have you ever seen it or? It, this is so. I've never seen one of the Synergy ones. This is so light. The very first prototype of the C vinyl. You see, these are different stages. Yep. And this was the one which we uh, originally worked on. 
you see it's uh, it's done by me <laughs> so and I often don't give a shit <laughs> how it looks like I just want to get it you might uh, get it working get the tone right yeah um, so this is the one which we worked on and um, as I said this is a prototype which is the reason why there is a clear solar ma mask and stuff but so you get an idea about the topology you got all the controls on the front PCB all the tubes and switching logic on that uh, main PCB and this is the cartridge which slides right into the, the slot and makes all the necessary co connections what is the weight of the of this head? Oh, now you're asking me something. I, yeah, but it's, like, it, but it's. I could tell you probably in kilo better than in okay. kilogram better than <laughs> in, in uh, pounds. I'm not, it's what is it? It's around 25 kilograms, what, okay. which is kind of 50. -ish yeah, 2.2 pounds. Two pounds. Yeah, about 50 pounds. Something like yeah. that. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of a range like a regular. Regular 50, 50. Okay, so what are the different amp? preamp modules that you're making now. So you have Steve's. Steve's is our is latest the ones. There? Yeah, we have, is it a Morgan we have two there? different angle ones. We have the Morgan AC, yeah. um, which is amazing. One of my most favorite models when mm -hmm. it comes uh, modules when it comes to break up stuff and cleaner. Um, we have the two Bogners upcoming, which okay. I'm, I'm pretty amazed about. This is the Uberschall and the Ecstasy. We have two Frayex, uh, the Ultra Lead and the Deliverance. The Deliverance is down the road a little, mm -hmm. but actually this is one of my most favorite ones. Cool. So, um, and there is for sure we have the we have several uh, Friedman like the Dirty Shirley, the BE. Yeah. Nature so these these preamps are incredibly versatile. You put a lot of a yeah. lot of things, a lot of versatility with all the yeah. little switches and things like yeah. that. Yeah. You get a lot of sounds, a lot of great sounds out of them. Yeah. So it's a it's a useful system. It's a useful system which you can com also combine, which is a good thing. Combine with any sort of model, for example, mm -hmm. which more and more people do. Um, so you can get quite some. Flexibility and fun out of it. And it's nice to collect the uh, to collect the different ones and just swap them out. It takes mm -hmm. two seconds to put one in. It's right. great. Yeah. Yeah. I love that platform. You know, you I was check it out. We're gonna make sure that you get, that you get one. Well, I was I was really change. bummed when when Randall when that was all discontinued. And th that was years ago though. Yeah. Now, right? The Randall. Yeah. With Randall, what you had to do is eventually you got to a point where you just. Um, you, you, I would just scour Reverb or eBay, and, and it became harder and harder to find because mm. I've had a head for years and years. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I only have two of the three modules yeah. working. Yeah. And um, so, so the good thing about those ones is also that they're that each of them is two channel, which so is I think is way better. Yeah. Yeah. Now you make Tone King too, right? Yeah. So I I don't know if Rhett uh, told you uh, he has the Attenuator, mm -hmm. and I have. Yeah, the, we just, we were just. We so I have the out. Iron King. I have the Iron uh, Man, Man Two, and I got that. And then Rhett went and bought his right after, and I tried it out for two seconds. And I said, I'm a big. I, I like attenuators, but there's very few good ones. And their attenuator that they make is amazing. It is a beast. Great, great, yeah. It is a beast. Yeah. It weighs. Uh, I don't know it's, how many kilos. It's. it's <laughs> it is it's intense, so yeah, it but is. it sounds. Great. Mm -hmm. When you turn it down, your amp tone does not change at all. Yeah. I'm a big fan, yeah. and I have a question for you. Okay. Rhett told me this, but I couldn't figure this out. I didn't know if it was true. But even though I use it like this, it does work. When you turn it all the way down and you use the DI out, I think it's the D direct out. Um, you can run it into a cab sim then, right? And it doesn't hurt the amp. It puts a load on the amp. Yes. Is that correct? That's correct. So I'm not going to be damaging any no. of my amps or anything. No, yeah. I've used it like that and it works fine, but yeah. I'm thinking like, totally, is this can totally cool do to do that? Yeah, you can totally do that. Okay. Yeah. I also use it with speakers. I use it a lot. I've used it in a bunch of my videos. Um, Good. <laughs> and uh, I usually have it on top of the on top of the amp. The when you're developing something like that, what what are the why is the thing is so heavy? What is what is making it? It's so this original design goes back to the days when Mark Patel 
um, was involved with Tone King. I mean, he started it okay. originally, and he came up with that design. Um, so what we did is we tweaked it for several purposes. Um, but what you have to make sure is that you have a sort of a resistive and inductive load, which has the characteristics of a speaker, so to speak. So um, a speaker has a certain frequency curve with a hump in the bass frequencies yeah. and it um, um, goes up again in the higher frequencies. You kind of have to simulate that. Hmm? And this is really important because then the interaction with the power amp, because the, it's, it's an interaction between the speaker, the secondary side of the output transformer, the primary side of the output transformer and the power amp tubes. So, and then there is still a negative feedback which comes in, um, but along this interaction is crucial, which is the reason if you just put a resistive load in it, it will never feel right. It feels like, well, this is not a tube amp almost. Right. So, um, you have to make sure that you have, the, uh, that there is that interaction between. Okay, let me ask you about a resistive load. So, I have an old Tom Schultz power soak. Would that be a resistive load? Actually, you know those? Not, yeah, I know. You I, know those from from yeah, the '80s. And I'm I, not sure if, if they if they are purely resistive or if they had also an inductive load. I can't I can't tell you. Okay, but I know these things. I've used them for I've used it forever. Still, the thing works great. Still worked and everything until I got yours. I mean, I honestly that was so innovative back. then. It was so innovative. Totally. Yeah. And I've never found one until I found until I saw yours. When I saw yours, I saw it at a store in Atlanta, Righteous. Um, guitars. Mm. I walked in there and I said, what is that? He said, it's an attenuator. I said, oh, can I check it out? And as soon as I picked it up, I said, oh, I want to try this. I went in, I put it, I forget what I used it through, I think uh, divided by 13 or something, and um, or no, maybe it was a, a 50 watt head or something, I can't remember. And as soon as I plugged it in, I said, I turned it down and I cranked the amp and I said, oh, this." then I turned it back up. I said, this is amazing. I'll buy it right then. Yeah. And it's the first, atten I've been looking for attenuators. I bought other attenuators in the past and and I never have liked any of them. They changed the tones. They, they Some of them have switches to add brightness and everything. It's like, no, no, no. They need to just need, yeah. You need to be able to turn it down and, have, and the t sound is exactly the same. And then I showed it to Rhett. He came over to the studio. And then he went and got the mini. The, the mini one yeah. the next day. Yeah. Yeah. So um, he's usually using low power and yes. low water gems. That makes total okay. Sense. Let me ask you this: If I play my, um, I have like an old Model T, a Sun Model T. I don't know how many watts it is. Mm -hmm. If I go over a hundred watts. I have to be careful, right? You have to be careful at a certain point. Um, yeah. It's going to handle a little more, but depending on how hard you crank it and how long you're going to... Okay, so if I turn it, if I keep the volume down, if, I, if I'm if i using the sun and I'm not, I mean, I'm not, if I'm not turning it on 10, is it actually using less power? I mean, you usually, you usually hear when the power amp gets into saturation, right? Yes. Because then it's kind of making mids comes up and bases go down a little. So... Um, when you're at that point, you can be pretty sure you put out everything, almost everything what the amp can deliver. Okay. Um, and from there on, if you hit it long enough, there's never something guaranteed because we could we could probably rate it for three, four hundred watt, uh, but that would just be too big of a unit. So yeah. There are certainly some some compromises, but usually it ha it handles. So I recommend for any of you that have tube amps that you love the sound of but they're too loud for you the Iron Man Mini is it Mini? is it the one the smaller one what's it no, called? The, the, the smaller one is the Mini which is yeah. 30 watts 30 watts and the Iron Man 2 is the one I have that handle up to 100 watts right. and it is really a great solution where you just yeah. um, you can turn it down you can use your speakers if you have a 412 cab 212 cab doesn't matter down to a pretty much bedroom volume, or you can turn it all the way down, use the DI out or direct out into a IR box a cabinet simulator and and, uh, and plug it directly in your DAW and play through your monitor speakers, sure. which to me is really a great use. To the, if I can use my the heads that I have along with the pedals, 
I'm very happy then. I can get the sounds I'm used to hearing yeah. and um, and I can play at a level that I can talk over so I can use use it for my YouTube videos. Because I need to be able to play stuff that's quiet enough because I'm constantly, I don't want to be editing things because a lot of times I'm demonstrating things and I'm talking over it. Mm -hmm. So it has to be of a certain volume, yeah. but I want that tone still. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's the challenge that's which, we are, which we face which we all, in every location. That's right. Other. I mean, so we have to make sure that we are able to have the same, well, the same guitar tone at, at almost any level. I think that's, that's also where the market totally goes. I mean, IR loaders are a big part of it, which I totally dig. I mean, um, it's a great technology. It's absolutely, the I think, the future. I agree. Um, so we're going to have to make sure that we can use regular amps at any given volume and make them make them sound right. I think that's that's so. I think that's the approach, at least for me. It is. So. <laughs> hey everybody! I'm here with Joe Morgan of Morgan Amps. This is mine. This is uh. Tell me about the M MVP sixty six. Um, MVP sixty six is the big brother of my MVP twenty three. MVP is really like my model numbers are fairly simple. Um, MV is master volume, P is power scaling. And the 66, I'm using KT66s in this amp, Love as this. opposed to the EL84s that you find in the 23 watt version. Yep. And then because I you know, needed a little extra room for the heat from the big tubes um, and a bigger chassis, I had room to put a uh, foot switchable adjustable boost on it. So in the back you've got a switch and a... Cool. Um, yeah, so gives you just a little bit extra that you can get up and over the mix with. But uh, with the power scaling, this amp is a 60 watt amp, and you can go from 60 watts down to a watt, and anywhere in between, wherever you need to. Just dial so, easy. so Joe, are, is power scaling just here now on things? I mean, is that kind of where the where the where guitar amp and just where people what people want nowadays? Well, gone are the days of being able to have 100 watt and full stacks, and yeah, you know, like and gone are the days too where you're relying on your guitar amplification to fill the yeah, arena. Exactly. Right? It just it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, with sound reinforcement and everything else, stages are getting quieter and quieter and quieter. A lot of like, um, especially like big name artists, your, your Carrie Underwoods and um, the like, are moving to um, either like fractals or some type of camper, any, any, like just to remove all the stage noise at all so that they have more control in the house. Um, yeah, so I think smaller amps are the future, but I also, um, the scaling is just one of those things that it doesn't work across like all platforms. Like I wouldn't put this on a fixed bias amp, like, okay. a, a, like a Marshall or a Fender, but it works well in a cathode bias amp. And this is the first time I've done it with big bottle tubes, just because I, I didn't like the way that it, it compressed and affected big bottles normally, mm -hmm. but I worked it out on this so that I, I'm in a happy place where I'm still getting a little bit of that extra compression, but not, it's not to the degree that like most power scaling amps that I've ever played, it just seems to suck the life out of it the second you turn it down. What uh, what do you have in this cabinet? It's a 4x12. No, but what, uh, what speakers do you have? Uh, G12H75s, okay. Creambacks. I use that for pretty much everything. That speaker is just it's voiced to my ear. G12H30, right? Love that speaker forever. And having a 75 watt version of that is just perfect for me. When you're developing a new amp, are you, where, where do you start with it? I is start it just with, conceptually you start with? I kind of start with the player. Yeah. You know, I got a ton of pro guys use my stuff. Yeah. Guys that just absolutely depend. It's how they make their living, right? Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking about. When somebody asks me for, hey, this would be really cool, but I need a little bit more headroom out of it, or I need, like, I wish I could do that. Yeah. Right, and then I'll take that idea, if it's good, and run with it and go, like, okay, well, let me see if I can solve that problem and give you something that you can use that's not, you know, a, a, I'm not... I mean, there are, there are a lot of amp companies out there that are building, like, like cute stuff and, like, things that, I mean, fill a space and, like, it's fun to go and grab and play at home, but I, my product is really great. You can use it at home; it's going to sound yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, for pros. But it's yeah, it's meant. It's really meant to go out on tour and yeah. be used. 
So that's how long does it take to it. go from the drawing board of an, an idea like this oh. to actually getting it out at NAM here for you know for people to see? You know, in the old days when it was my shop, and I'd have an idea, uh, I'd pull out the drills and like, okay, we're going to modify this and we're going to make this work. And now it's okay, we're going to we're going to need to have a production run of transformers done. Well, what's the window on that? Well, that's going to be eight weeks. Well, how much would the chassis come in? And it's like <laughs> you end up with this six month cycle to do something that I used to do in a day. Yeah. Right. And um, that's that has been the most frustrating part about scaling up. Yeah. Where you just it's you're no longer in a little rowboat. You move in an aircraft carrier, and it just takes forever to get that thing all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this amp here is, uh, you're going to be playing it, you're going to have it in AM and you're going to be yeah. demo demoing it. Yeah, this one is, um, the cool part about this, I, with everything that I do, it's really easy to make a $5,000 amplifier that's cool, as like, sounds great. Um, it's not as easy to try to, like, this is eighteen ninety nine, nineteen hundred 1900 bucks. Yeah. It's hard to do that without... You know, really having to cut corners and make decisions that are like, okay, if I do this, is it going to affect the tone? You know, if I add this, is it going to do anything to the tone, or am I just adding a feature for a feature's sake? You know, it's that kind of those kind of decisions are near and dear to my heart because, dude, eighteen, nineteen hundred bucks for a head is expensive. It is. Yeah, I mean, it's like I couldn't afford that when I was in high school. You know, I could they didn't cost that when you're in high school, though. Yeah, true that. I, uh, <laughs> dude, I bought an L five. Right, the old lab series. Lab series. Yeah. I had one. Two tw- oh man, two twelve with the compressor on it. Yeah, I love that. Dude, it was so cool. My wife sold it in the garage sale for twenty five bucks. Um, Norland made them, I think it was right. I, I, it was, but they Gibson, were loud. The hundred, right? the Gibson, yeah, Norland yeah. Gibson, yeah, yeah at the right, time. right. And they they were unbelievably loud. Yeah, they were cool. They had the four ten one and the two twelve. I had the two twelve. Yeah, yeah, Dude, I love that. But I think I bought that amp for close to eleven hundred bucks. Yeah. You know, and I like saved forever to get that thing. I, I heard that Ty Tabor from King's X used it on one of their records. Ah. And it. He also used that weird stuff in the 80s that. What was the name of that company? It was just horrible. <laughs> um, I'm going to cut this part out. <laughs> <laughs> we love Ty Tabor. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> But um, yeah, no. It sounded good with the Lab Series, though. BB King too. BB right? King did, yeah. yeah. That's all for now. Please subscribe here to my Everything Music YouTube channel. If you're a first-time viewer, don't forget to ring the bell. If you're interested in the Beato book, go to my website at www.rickbeato.com. You can find it there. That's how I support the channel. Follow me on Instagram at rickbeato1. The new Beato Ear Training program is out. Go to BeatoEarTraining.com and check out the introduction video. And don't forget, if you want to support the channel even more, think about becoming a member of the Beato Club. Thanks for watching.